Well, welcome back to the Lamp Post Listener. My name is Daniel. I'm Phil. And this is a podcast where we journey chapter by chapter through C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. This is chapter one of The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, The Picture in the Bedroom. I'm excited. <laughs> you, just, you just stare at me and give our listeners that wonderful three-second gap there. That's right. <laughs> I'm sorry. We're, Let the silence do the work. We're That's already started. Protein. We've already started the season bickering at one another, Phil. <laughs> I'm worried. <laughs> me too. Well, listeners, welcome back to season three of the show. We're going to be talking about the voyage of the Dawn Treader in this season. And if you're if you're new, if you're a new listener to the show, thank you so much for listening. If you're a, a veteran listener, thank you so much for continuing to follow along with us. Uh, for any new listeners that we have, just a real quick, uh, there's been some confusion sometimes because if you look down at your copy of The Voyage of the Dawn Treader and you're a new listener, you might be wondering why your book says number five, but we keep saying season three. And Phil and I are not the best mathematicians, but this is actually not a mistake. This was on purpose. And we're not going to get into it because we've done it in the past, but if you have any questions about why we're reading these books in publication order, versus chronological order. There's a link in the episode's description uh, by a friend friend of the show, uh, Brian, over at Narnia Web, has a wonderful, wonderful YouTube video that explains why there's different orders to reading this series. Phil, is there anything else we need to run by our listeners before we get started? One change from previous seasons, we're going to try to incorporate Only one. baby voices. We're only going to... I'm not going to do that to our <laughs> listeners. Can you imagine? Yeah. They oh, already man. have... Yeah. What if sales skyrocket? Then we have to talk like that the rest of the time. I mean, if that's what the listeners want, that's what we'll give, give the them. I don't think they that's want. what they want, though. No. So we are going to do something different. We're going to have um, either a voicemail or an email from a listener every episode. All right. We're done with, we're done with the uh, boring stuff. Now we can jump in the that's show, right. right? Back to Narnia. Back to Narnia. So we have the third book in the Chronicles of Narnia series, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Now, last time, Phil, when we read Prince Caspian, C.S. Lewis made this very easy for us because he told us exactly what the book was about. Do you remember what it was about? I do. It was about Prince Caspian. (laughs) Well, Lewis had told us it was about the restoration of the true religion after corruption. And so we kind of put those lenses on as we were reading that book and it kind of, we were able to see the themes that Lewis was writing because he told us up front what we should be looking for. Uh, He has not done that with this book. There are a lot of themes. We are definitely still going to talk about Planet Narnia when we get to relevant sections of the book. But I think there'll have to be a little bit more digging here to talk about some of the deeper themes that Lewis is writing into this work. I think so too. One other thing that I thought was really interesting as I was doing research and maybe you you already know this too, there are some significant differences or changes that Lewis made from the American, to, or the, from the British to the American uh, text. It, originally, it was called The Voyage of the Philosopher's Stone, and so he <laughs> changed it to be uh, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader for us Americans because we, we didn't know who, what a philosopher, what a philosopher was. was. Yeah. I, will, I will say that I'm used to the changes being a little more significant. Mm-hmm. In, like Not just significant, but also just more changes. Like in Harry Potter, they changed all the words. Um, I think the only one that was left was mum. They said mum instead of mom to make us feel a little British. But they changed a lot of words for the Harry Potter books. Yeah, they did. That's and This I, one was they changed the word stupid to... I don't remember what, what's in this chapter, so we'll get to it when I get to my notes. So yeah, yeah, there is one change that Lewis made in this first chapter and then later in chapter 12. And right. we can't talk about that because this thing we had mentioned for new listeners, Phil, you have not read this book. Right. Maybe you, did you I'm, read this one as a kid or... I do remember starting this one. I'm not sure if I finished it as a kid, okay. having it read to me. So I am f- more familiar with this book. We are still both definitely Narnia novices, but you this is this is a fresh uh, read for you. No. That's not a thing people say, is it? A fresh read? No. <laughs> no, no. It's a thing w- now. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we are tastemakers. I will say that um, we are staying away from the chapter 12 intentionally, and we're not going to talk about that change yet. Correct. We are aware of the change. Yeah, we know that there is a change in there as well, too, so... All right, well, in the very last episode, we finished Prince Caspian. The Pevensies had been in Narnia. They'd fought in the Second Battle of Baruna. They had saved the day. They had put Caspian on the throne. And then Peter and Susan were rewarded by being told they could never come back. <laughs> and so yeah, they, they, told that they were told they were not going to be invited back. Too old. Too, too old, old to, to begin the training. <laughs> right. We are a few minutes in, and we have already had two deep cut references. If you're new to the, the fantasy world. People are going to find out pretty quickly there's a lot of Star Wars references. Yeah. 
So Peter and Susan, we knew were not going to be back. And Lucy and Edmund, we thought, would be back. And so we pick up like pretty close to where we were. Yeah. I th- Maybe the, a few months. The kids were, weren't they going off to school? At, at the beginning slash end of Prince Caspian. So maybe this is at the end of the well, school year. Well, this is summer, so this is less than a year later. Yeah, the end of the school year. Mm-hmm. So why don't we go ahead and, and jump into our chapter summary. And just to remind listeners, we have 150 words to explain what has happened in the past chapter. I do the odd chapters, and Phil does the even chapters. All right, you ready, Phil? I'm ready. A year after returning from Narnia, Edmund and Lucy are stuck spending the summer at the miserable home of their cousin Eustace. Eustace is a pesky ten-year-old who believes he is much better than the Pevensies because he isn't concerned with silly things like imaginary stories and worlds. In one of the bedrooms of the house, Edmund and Lucy notice a picture of a beautiful Narnian-looking ship. It has a single purple sail and green sides. The prow of the ship is sculpted to look like a dragon. As they continue to stare at the image, it begins moving. Edmund, Lucy, and Eustace are transported from the bedroom into the sea from the painting. They are quickly pulled out of the water and find Caspian, Reepishe, and a crew of Narnian sailors aboard the ship. Greetings are shared by the crew, and Edmund and Lucy change into Narnian clothes. Well done. 149 words. Whoa, got it close there. I did. Phil, what are some of your first takeaways with this chapter, of this whole book, I guess? I love how quickly Lewis gets back into Narnia. And you said this last time, too. You're yeah. like, I don't want any of that England stuff. Get me out of there. I want but Narnian there's, there's stuff. there's enough to establish that, okay, here's what the real world's like. Mm-hmm. Um, I also, I think it's funny how he kind of glosses over the parents. Like The parents never seem to be there. Yeah, it's kind of like the Charlie Brown thing where they're just playing the right. trombone in the background. Right. Yeah. And the mother doesn't even have a name that we know of. Maybe the father doesn't. No, I think the mom's name is Alberta, isn't it? In in this chapter, it's just the mother. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I think it was funny how uh, Susan was sent to America because she's the pretty one of the family. But I also feel like Lucy's a little kid and... That was just an odd thing to say. I want to talk about that when we get to yeah, it. Yeah, we could jump into that too. I thought I thought Lewis was gonna throw some shade at, at Susan. I'm still not conv- and I'm not I don't want to get into anything else in the future with these books. Um I'm still not convinced that Lewis likes Susan. I s mm. I kinda think that he created her in the first book and then in Caspian was writing her, was like, actually I don't think I like this character. <laughs> Cause I, I personally was not super happy with her treatment in the last book. I, I just didn't think there really was much to her as a character there. Okay. But any other any other just kind of takeaways for you with this first chapter? I did admire also how Lewis spends one paragraph talking about the previous adventures. Mm-hmm. And it's enough to remind you if you have read it, but it's also not too detail oriented to bore you. And he just covers it and then he gets it out of the way and now he's on to the current story. Yeah, one of the takeaways for me, I had I had a, a couple that I'll share, but I really think you could read this book without reading the first two. Yeah. I, don't, I don't think you would benefit from all the backstory that you would obviously get if you read them in the correct order, but if you just picked this book off the shelf and just started reading it, Lewis does a pretty good job of recapping what's happened without boring any returning readers, which is what I'm hoping we're doing with our show now. <laughs> um, the other thing I loved is... I think this is some of Lewis's best narrating that he does here in this first chapter. The the character of Eustace that he has created, he's Eustace is one of my maybe top three Narnian characters. And one of the things that I love so much about the way that Lewis writes Eustace is, to me, Eustace is very annoying, but he is never not entertaining. And so that's why I, I'm so happy every time he shows up on the page because I don't find him like, oh, Eustace again. I'm like, oh, yes, Eustace again right. <laughs> because he's that entertaining. And I get the feeling, I mean, let's juxtapose him with Susan. C.S. Lewis seems to really enjoy writing Eustace where I'm not convinced that he really enjoys writing Susan. It's similar to when a, a bad character or an antagonist in a movie is just such a good character yeah. that you kind of really enjoy that character, mm-hmm. even though the, what they're doing is horrible. It's just a really good character, and I think yeah. that's happening here. That's that's how Picks I feel about it. a special talent. Yeah, that's how I feel about Eustace. So why don't we go ahead, why don't I read the uh, first paragraph here? 
Let's do it. This is one of the best. For, uh, before we even look, I'm get, we haven't even started. I'm getting excited. This is one of the best opening sentences to any book that I've ever read. And I don't speak in absolutes, so that means something. That's right. You never <laughs> speak in absolutes. No, I never do. There once was a boy called Eustace Clarence Scrub, and he almost deserved it. His parents called him Eustace Clarence, and his masters called him Scrub. I can't tell you how his friends spoke to him, for he had none. He didn't call his father and mother father and mother, but Harold and Alberta. They were very up-to-date and advanced people. They were vegetarians, non-smokers, and teetotalers, and wore a special kind of underclothes. In their house, there was very little furniture and very few clothes on beds, and the windows were always open. What a paragraph. What a start to this book. So I think that this is C.S. Lewis hitting his stride in terms of narration because it's not over the top. It's not pulling you out of the story. It's so subtle but information-packed. And I think that different people may interpret it different ways, but the vegetarian, non-smoker, teetotalers, those aren't necessarily bad things, but it does kind of communicate something about... The kind of people that they are. The environment that they're growing up in. And it, it also, I feel like Lewis shares some of his disdain for those things. We already know that he was he was a big smoker. Mm-hmm. Uh, and wasn't there another... Have we already talked about this? I feel like in one of the other books, he kind of like... Inter- uh, interjected some of his own voice talking about a character who who didn't smoke. Is that right? Yeah. What was so. where? Who was that? I think it was in Caspian. Yeah, I can't remember what character One it was. One of the people but, didn't smoke. Yeah, and it's Lewis is like how disgusting of him, right? Right. And I I think it's funny because you get a sense of you know who these people are, the way that they're they're raising Eustace, and I I think it's just it's both a great picture, but it's also very funny, and it's it's very tongue in cheek, and I really enjoy that. And that's coming from, this is coming from two city dwellers who are very much kind of fit a lot of those same stereotypes, I feel like. Of well, the, uh, that's what's so funny know. is I've fit into two-thirds of these descriptions, I feel like. I mean, you and I are very much the stereotypical millennial, you know, city dwellers. Yeah. <laughs> and so, but it's just fun. Like, even though, like, Lewis is like, oh, that's such a, and there's, you get the sense that uh, Harold and Alberta and Eustace think they are much better than everyone else because they are doing things the the quote unquote right way. Yeah, I I don't think that people necessarily ever have a problem with the specific thing that you're choosing to abstain from. I think it's the attitude that seems to come with it quite a bit. No, absolutely. I I think that's that's what he's going for. And you hear this in Eustace, who doesn't like to read any books with you know that are imaginary. He likes he likes uh, animals that are dead and pinned on pinned on a card. He likes books of information, right? His his ones are pic- favorite ones are ones with pictures of grain elevators. <laughs> like he just you get the sense that he is very much like I want knowledge just for the sake of having knowledge, not to use it, not to think critically. I just want to store up knowledge so that I can be better than you. Which goes with the grain houses part too. Oh, I didn't even make yeah. that connection. That's I kind love of fun. that. Yeah. And so Lewis goes on. He says Eustace Clarence disliked his cousins the four Pevensies. And Phil, while I was doing research on this chapter, I learned this is actually the first time that the word Pevensey appears in the Chronicles of Narnia. Really? Yeah. Hmm. I went back through uh, my handy-dandy Kindle. I did the search. It is The, the word Pevensey or Pevensies does not show up in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe or in Prince Caspian. Really? Yeah, this is the first time it's used. And so I want to actually jump and into a little dis- little sidebar here about uh, the the surname Pevensey. Is that okay? Let's do it. So one of the books I mentioned last season was a book called The Keys to the Chronicles, Unlocking the Symbols of C.S. Lewis's Narnia. It's written by a professor named uh, Marvin Hinton. And in, in, in the book, he talked about the last name Pevensey. And, and Hinton makes the connection between the last name Pevensey and Pevensey, which is spelled with a Y at the end, which is a small village where it was uh, William the Conqueror actually landed in 1066 uh, when he first landed in England, when he crossed, crossed the English Channel. And Hinton points out that this is really interesting because the Pevenseys serve as our entry point into Narnia, right? Every single time we, that we've gone through so far, it has always been through the Pevenseys. And just like this village of Pevensey was the entry point for into England for William and the rest of his army. And, and Lewis obviously would have known all this stuff. He studied medieval history. 
in literature. And so I thought this was that's such a cool connection that I had never picked up on before. Yeah. I love finding out stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, I think I already talked. We talked in one of the Dancing Lawn episodes that I'm not. Even, I wasn't even sure where Oxford and Cambridge were in England. So I'm not. <laughs> it's not like I am a, a geographic whiz here. You know, they they don't just like Mr. Tumnus. I don't know my geography very well. I should have should have studied more as yeah. a young fawn. So, you know, we just get the sense that Eustace is just so mean to his cousins, and but he's excited that they're coming so that he can be mean. He's just. Not the kind of person you want to really spend any time with. He's being the worst already. Yeah. And were you familiar at all with Eustace? Did you remember him? Or is this like a first thing, a, first, a new thing for you? First time I'm, that I remember yeah. that I'm finding out about him. And you have not, correct, seen the movie or or miniseries yeah, for so this one. The Prince Caspian and Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, I've seen both series of those, the BBC and the Disney Walton sure. versions. For this one, never saw the Disney version, and I, I may have seen the BBC version mm-hmm. back in the day. Yeah. So this, I mean, this is really, really fresh for you. Yes. So in this exposition dump from Lewis here at the beginning of the chapter, we learn a couple of other really interesting things. So we learn that the the Pevensey's father, he is going, I think, doing a, like a a sixteen week lecture in America. Mm-hmm. So he and and Mrs. Pevensey are taking Susan with them. And Peter is going to live with the professor. So we get this line here that the professor, do you, or do you want to go ahead and read it? But he had somehow become poor since the old days and was living in a small cottage with only the one bedroom to spare. Which is really interesting. I mean, do you like that we don't know what's going on here? I do. I like that it's left up to the imagination. We also have several more books coming. So maybe we'll find out. Okay. In the future, but I I like that it says that it happens, and you're left wondering, and then it that's a point in the story, and then you get to move on. Yeah, I mean, you're big on like I just want to get to Narnia. I'm also interested by a couple other things that Lewis writes, which is that he talks about the the house that these four children had had wonderful adventures long ago in the war years. It's been two years, so I'm really confused about that, and also the timeline from what I'm reading and, and doing research and just adding the years up myself, it's 1942. So I guess maybe what he's talking about is that the bombing of London is over at this point, but World War II is still raging on. It's, it hasn't yeah. stopped. So it's maybe it's just that London too. is no longer being attacked, and that's why he's not. He's saying, oh, the war years are over, even though we, we know that it's, it's not 1945 yet. Is he saying the war years are over? Well, he said in the war years, which makes me assume that we're not, we're no longer in the war years. Also sounds like I'm saying warriors. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, well, we can move on. We're, we, Like you said, Phil, we want to go ahead and get to Narnia. Well, let's address one more thing. Yeah. They send Susan to America because she's the pretty one of the family. <laughs> yeah. Um, my, my impression of that is that I think they want her to get married, but she also seems pretty young for that. Yeah, isn't that isn't that an odd thing? I don't think they're taking her there. To, I mean, maybe maybe. Yeah, I don't. I don't think that's what's happening at all. I'm I, I'm not sure why that's there. Yeah, and the listeners love that when you and I just read something we're like we don't know. <laughs> well, Phil, any other things before we go ahead and make the transition to the world of Narnia? Well, let's talk about that transition itself. Yeah, you want me to go ahead and start reading it? Yeah. They were in Lucy's room, sitting on the edge of her bed, and looking at a picture on the opposite wall. It was the only picture in the house that they liked. Aunt Alberta didn't like it at all. That was why it was put away in the little back room upstairs. But she couldn't get rid of it because it had been a wedding present from someone she did not want to offend. It was a picture of a ship, a ship sailing straight toward you. Her prow was gilded and shaped like the head of a dragon with wide open mouth. She had only one mast and one large square sail, which was a rich purple. The sides of the ship, what you could see of them where the gilded wings of the dragon ended, were green. She had just run up to the top of one glorious blue wave, and the nearer slope of that wave came down toward you with streaks and bubbles on it. She was obviously running fast before a gay wind listing over a little on her port side. And by the way, if you're going to read this story at all, and if you don't know already... You had better get it into your head that the left of the ship, when you are looking ahead, is port, and the right is starboard. All the sunlight fell on her from the side, and the water on that side was full of greens and purples. 
On the other, it was darker blue from the shadow of the ship. That's a pretty ship. Yeah, that's some good imagery combined with a little bit of information about the port and starboard. Yeah. I do remember that part. For some reason, I think that was hard for me to grasp as a kid. I was like, why don't they just say left and right? Do you know why? I don't know why they don't just say left and right. Did you look it up? I did not. Oh, I thought you were you know, like setting yourself up to be like, I did some research. <laughs> setting up our listeners to, <laughs> to email us. Now. Well, let's talk a little bit about some uh, nautical vocabulary here because I don't, I don't know your background, Phil. I did a little bit of sailing when I was younger, but it has been a while. And so things like port and starboard are familiar to me. But even when they had written, uh, when Lewis had written prow, I was like, I think that's, the part I couldn't exactly remember, so I looked it up. And just for listeners who aren't sure, the prow is the portion of the bow. So the the bow is the front of the ship. So the prow is the portion of the bow that is above the water. So the prow is that dragon head okay. for the Don Treader. And then the stern is the back of the ship. Okay. What's a goalie? I don't know. <laughs> the <laughs> we'll person who stops the soccer ball from going in the oh in the net. <laughs> You're hilarious. Do you know what a hatch is? No. The hatch is the trap door that lets you go under the boat. Oh, I didn't Under the deck. Oh, I also looked up uh, the poop deck, and you've got to be... You have to be very careful. We're very professional here, here, Yeah, we we do not joke about such things. We're professional podcasters. We don't do that. We're not, actually. We are very much amateurs. Uh, I actually didn't know this. I always just thought that was the weird... I don't know. I was like, I don't know why they call it a poop deck. The the funniest part is that it's labeled in the picture by Pauline Baines. Yeah. Right across from chapter one, and it says poop deck. But there's also this ornate little flag thing that's just off to the side, and it says poop. <laughs> it's just it's telling you what things are. Well, the poop deck is the highest deck on a ship. It's usually, not always, but usually where the wheel is, and it's it's the floor of the poop is the, uh, r- the ceiling of the largest cabin that usually the captain is in. Ah. But... This is just stuff that I learned uh, while studying this chapter. So if any of our listeners are sailors or have, you know, have any nautical experience, this is a great time for some listener feedback in the next episode or so. That's right. Well, Phil, as Edmund and Lucy are looking at this painting, they mentioned it looked quite like a Narnian ship. And good old friend Eustace comes in. And he's talking about them playing your old game. And then here's something that, that Lewis writes. And this is the little part that got changed. Last year, when he had been staying with the Pevensies, he had managed to hear them all talking of Narnia, and he loved teasing them about it. He thought, of course, that they were making it all up. And as he was far too stupid to make anything up himself, he did not approve of that. And so this phrase here, far too stupid to make anything up himself, this is the part that actually changed. So you want to tell us a little bit more about that? C.S. Lewis got back the copy for the United States, and he was flipping through it, and he was revising it, and he scratched out that part and changed it. And What did he change it to? He wrote in the American edition that Eustace was quite incapable of making anything up himself. However, Phil, if you remember back to... Uh, the line the witch in the wardrobe when we talked about Maugrim, whose name was changed to Fenris Ulf, and then in ninety four when Harper Collins got the rights back, they changed it back to Maugrim because in the American version it was Fenris Ulf, and then the British it was Maugrim. This a same a similar thing happened here where in nineteen ninety four Harper Collins changed it back to the original version, right against the author's wishes, which is hardly ever done. It's, it's When I was reading, I With don't know books. if it's necessarily against his wishes. It's one of the things where they argued, well, both. The same way that reason that you know publishers have argued, well, you can put them in either in chronological order because Lewis kind of said you could in that one letter that one time. So they were they were like, well, he did, he did leave it in the British one and he changed it for the American one. So I guess it doesn't actually matter. And I would argue that it is important here that actually... Ha- Writing that Eustace is far too stupid to make anything up himself is not really true to this character. And we can't get into this because I don't want to go further in the book because you have not read it yet. I think we learned that Eustace is, it's not true that he's too stupid. It's, I would say it's, he's incapable at this point. Hmm. The, the way that he has been raised, the just arrogance that just sees out of this little boy <laughs> is going to keep him from being able to use his imagination. He sees everything as very... He wants things to be dry 
and he does not want to see a fun, colorful, imaginary land. He doesn't want to be SpongeBob and Patrick in that box. Remember that episode with the imagination? I, I did not. You weren't allowed to watch it, were you? No. Oh. I just don't remember that episode. Okay. Well, the so I, I really don't like this change. I really wish that this still said that he was quite incapable. It isn't the end of the world, but I do think it's, for a character that I care so much about, like Eustace, this really isn't true of him. Yeah. So you, you would prefer to say incapable. Yeah, that he was quite incapable, because yeah. I think that is true of Eustace at this point. The other theory is that C.S. Lewis, by the time he finished the book and had thought about it, started to like Eustace more. That's fair. Yeah, so it could be that. And yeah. incapable is different than stupid. Exactly, yeah. I mean, they definitely are different. And I think you're right, that maybe it was that Lewis started out wanting to dislike Eustace but ended up really liking him I don't necessarily know if I believe that though because I read some people saying that, that that might be a theory too because the way that this chapter writes Eustace he never comes across to me as a villain he comes across as just an annoying character who if you've read enough children's literature like you know maybe things will be different by the end of this story right so I I, I just I just don't know I, I wish we could really I wish we had more from Lewis that we could know about his thoughts on his own characters if you ever write a great novel I want you to go and change something arbitrarily <laughs> so that in a hundred years a bunch of nerds sit around <laughs> microphones and like what well, do you think what, this what means? do you think he meant by uh he said these instead of those do you think it was, it was actually it, it closer probably, <laughs> it was probably something like um hey the the t- spacing on this page doesn't look right so can you just make that word stupid be a little bit longer he's like yeah fine here you go or, you know, and then we're sitting here like diving deep into it but hey that's what we're here for that's right well, let's let's talk about another word that Eustace uses okay so he makes up a limerick and he goes some kids who played games about narnia got gradually balmier and balmier and lucy says well narnia and balmier don't rhyme to begin with and Eustace replies it's an assonance and you know he says it was so much more just like, ugh. It's an assonance. Yeah, <laughs> seriously. Did you know what an assonance was? I don't. So I'm hoping you can tell me. But yeah. then I also love that Edmund goes, don't ask him what an <laughs> assy thing gummy is. <laughs> yeah. So that I, just got us a PG-13 reading. <laughs> Eustace is, he, he, man, he's not the kid you want to have in your class, is he? He's just so annoying. Yeah. So he, he uses the, the, the word assonance, right? Which I looked up because I was like, I think it's when two words don't kind of rhyme, but they do. But like, that's not the right definition. So mm-hmm. I looked it up. Here's the Oxford English uh, Dictionary. In poetry, the repetition of the sound of a vowel or diphthong and non-rhyming stressed syllables near enough to each other for the echo to be discernible. So I actually like my definition of it's words that don't really rhyme, but they kind of do better. Right. Can you give me an example? Because it's not quite a slight Yeah, rhyme. no, I can't. Uh, Narnia and Balmier. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you. Moving on. No, an- another one might be um, penitence and reticence. So, mm. like, they don't really rhyme, but the way that they kind of flow, the way that their syllables are stressed, it, it does kind of work. Yeah, I'm stressed. Um, <laughs> Just going over this. What's though. the difference between an assonance and a slant rhyme? <laughs> We're going to keep moving on. <laughs> so, the picture begins to look as if it's moving. And so, Phil, you're going to go ahead and read that next portion, right? Yeah, so just to give you a sense of where we are, Edmund is trying not to engage with Eustace, and Lucy can't help but answer him when he says, why do you like it? And Lucy describes how the painting looks like it's moving. And Eustace is about to retort, but then he notices that it actually does look like it's moving. Mm -hmm. And then everyone starts to notice What they were seeing may be hard to believe when you read it in print, but it was almost as hard to believe when you saw it happening. The things in the picture were moving. It didn't look at all like a cinema either. The colors were too real and clean and out of doors for that. Down went the pro... Prow? Prow. Mm -hmm. Down went the prow of the ship into the wave, and up went a great shock of spray. And then up went the wave behind her, and her stern and her deck became visible for the first time and then disappeared as the next wave came to meet her, and her bows went up again. At the same moment, an exercise book, which had been lying beside Edmund on the bed, flapped, rose and sailed through the air to the wall behind him, and Lucy felt all her hair whipping round her face as it does on a windy day. And this was a windy day, but the wind was blowing out of the picture towards them. 
And suddenly with the wind came the noises, the swishing of waves and the slap of water against the ship's sides, and the creaking and the overall high, steady roar of air and water. But it was the smell, the wild, briny smell, which really convinced Lucy that she was not dreaming. I love, this is what I've missed so much. This was su- that's such a great paragraph. It is. It's a fantastic description. And the way he describes everything and then talks about the smell. And I also realized, I don't really remember smelling things in my dreams, but he transitions from this great description where you're picturing it in your head mm-hmm. and then introduces it as this is real to them. And here's why. You know, and one thing that I was thinking about as I was reading this chapter is, you know, a lot of Lewis's world of Narnia is kind of a hodgepodge of mythologies and magic and all these different things. And we, I mean, we've talked about that ad nauseum on the show, so I'm not going to get into that. But one thing we haven't talked about is how phenomenal of a job Lewis does taking magic, right, this, this more uh, fantastical element of the story, and making it feel so real and lived in. So as, as we're, we're literally looking at a picture of a ship moving in a picture, we're, we're getting descriptions of how it really, you know, feels and well, not just feel but all the senses of Edmund and Lucy are, are are talked about here and so we get that very real feeling of here's what it was like here's what it smelled like here's what they were hearing all of those things at the same time of this really magical element and so those two things together it, it's it's really really well done I, I feel like we haven't commented enough about how how strong Lewis is in combining realism with fantasy right and there's also a third element that's introduced here which is unusual usually they're going to narnia and they either don't know what's happening or they start to remember what's happening and they're kind of interested to see what happens yeah but this time eustace is there and he does not want to go yes he is sure (laughs) he actually says stop it yeah and i'm gonna jump in and go ahead and read that (laughs) stop it came eustace's voice squeaky with fright and bad temper It's some silly trick you two were playing. Stop it. I'll tell Alberta. Ow! The other two were much more accustomed to adventures. But just exactly as Eustace Clarence said Ow, they both said Ow too. The reason was that a great cold salt splash had broken right out of the frame, and they were breathless from the smack of it, besides being wet through. Oh, smash the rotten thing, cried Eustace, and then several things happened at the same time. Eustace rushed toward the picture. Edmund, who knew something about magic, sprang after him, warning him to look out and not to be a fool. Lucy grabbed at him from the other side and was dragged forward, and by this time either they had grown much smaller or the picture had grown much bigger. Eustace jumped to try to pull it off the wall and found himself standing on the frame. In front of him was not glass, but real sea, and wind and waves rushing up to the frame as they might to a rock. He lost his head and clutched at the other two who had jumped up beside him. There was a second of struggling and shouting, and just as they thought they had got their balance, a great blue roller surged up round them, swept them off their feet, and drew them down into the sea. Eustace's despairing cry suddenly ended as water got into his mouth. And if you stop right there, it sounds pretty dark. <laughs> the, end. the end. And check back in for season four. The Silver Chair. <laughs> um, this is, I think this is, in my opinion... And maybe this is kind of controversial because people like the first book too. This is the best transition to Narnia so far. I love how I'm getting sucked in as a reader as the <laughs> characters are getting sucked into the story too. Yeah. Eustace is like, he's not evil, but he's definitely unlikable enough that when bad stuff happens to him, you're like, yes. <laughs> you know? Right. Like, I don't want to see him actually get physically hurt or anything, right. but I definitely want him to be upset that he's getting wet. Like, yes, I'm 100% on board with that. It feels wonderful. It's also funny that by trying to stop the whole process, he actually takes everybody into Narnia yeah. with him because they're trying to help him out and they all get pulled in. Before we jump too far in here, because you, I, I want to take advantage of you not having read any other chapters. Every time the Pevensies have gone into Narnia, the first time it was because uh, Aslan was on the move, right? And so they needed to come back to help uh, dethrone the White Witch. The second time, Caspian blew the horn, and that brought them back to Narnia. What do you think is bringing them to Narnia right now? So I would say that it is because someone's invading, but 
from what I have read, I just I stopped at the summary part because uh-huh. I've only read one chapter. But I did read that this book stands out because it's the only book about Narnia where there's no villain. Yeah, uh, I would say there's no main villain. No I mean, main there, villain. There definitely are lots villains, of little villains, but there's. Yeah, I, I think that's true. So that that'll be interesting for you to kind of uncover what it is that has that has brought them back to Narnia. Well, Lucy and Edmund and Eustace, they're all in the water. And we actually, I really love Lewis, Lewis's writing here because he changes just to a very limited third-person perspective of Lucy. So all this, they've now all gone into Narnia, and now we really only get things from her point of view. As she's in the water, she keeps her head about her. She kicks off her shoes, as everyone ought to who falls into deep water in their clothes. And that is our good old buddy Jack making sure that everybody stands safe when they read this book. We should compile a list of all the safety things that we've learned from these books. Sure. Never lock yourself in a wardrobe. Always take your shoes off when you're in the ocean. You're lame if you don't smoke and drink. <laughs> that's, I mean, I, that's, listeners, Daniel is not saying that, but C.S. Lewis but kind C.S. of Lewis said that. Is saying that. <laughs> the, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I just, I thought that was, did that, did you think about that same thing? Did you think about closing the wardrobe door? Oh yeah, I've got a note right here. Okay. I said, add it to the wardrobe list. <laughs> I, like, add it to the list of safety. No, I get you, yeah. So as Lucy is in the water, Eventually, a stranger comes down, um, and all three of the children and this other stranger are pulled up, and when they all get on deck of the ship, Lucy finds out that who is it? Prince Caspian. It is, well, King Caspian now. King Caspian now. Yeah. Well, has it, has it been? See, I, I'm picturing the one from the movie, so I felt like... This this Caspian, the real Caspian, is 16 years. He is not 45 so years old. You like can be ben king Barnacles. at 16. Dude, you should go find some medieval history. There's some great, like, yeah, three-year-old kings and stuff. It's wonderful. Oh. Yeah. There was a, like, one of the last uh, emperors of Rome was, I think, he was, like, six years old. Oh, so, that yeah. explains a lot. That's why he's one of the last ones. It was, he was a proxy. But that's, we're not talking about that. <laughs> yeah, so, and just talk about ages, though, for a second. So, Caspian is 16. I know this does get hard because we've watched the movie and you do start thinking of Ben Barnes, who does a good job. I'm not anti-Ben Barnes at all. I like him as an actor. He's wonderful, but he is too old, <laughs> in my opinion. He's like a grown man. Uh, so, But Caspian's supposed to be 16, Lucy is 10, Edmund is 12, and Eustace is 9. But I don't know about you. In my head, I'm picturing... Caspian is, is about 16 in my head, but I have Edmund being closer to, like, and Lucy being, like, 14 and 12, respectively, with, like, Eustace being, like, 12 or so, too. Okay. But that, that's, I mean, that's not what... The, the companion to Narnia says. That's just in my head what they look like. So they're brought on board the ship, and what, what's going on? Not a lot's going on. Yeah. Lewis doesn't really tell us. We spend the rest of the chapter just kind of having the characters meet up and talk. and right. Shake hands, change clothes. Yeah. It's literally housekeeping. It's chapter <laughs> one housekeeping. Yeah. Reba Sheep is there, which we're very excited to see him again, or at least I was, right? Oh, he seems, um, you know, not a big fan of Eustace. Doesn't seem to like him that much. I wonder why. He's Um, a he's a straight shooter, and he also demands respect, but he also gives respect. mm -hmm. He's not getting it from Eustace. He he even says to uh, Lucy, "Let me just read this little this short little paragraph." Am I to understand? Said Reaper Sheep to Lucy after a long stare at Eustace, that this singularly discourteous person is under your Majesty's protection. Because if not, and then, and then something else happens. But like, I, I wonder what Reaper Sheep was going to say. I think we can both kind of guess where he was going with this. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's fun. And I, I think you'll really like the relationship between the two of them throughout this book. Okay. It's really great. Cool. That's all I'll say. Well, then we we've, don't find out much more. Caspian gives Lucy his quarters. He, uh, he has some of his old clothes for her to wear. And that's really where the chapter ends. I think things are very well set up, mm-hmm. and I'm really looking forward to see what seeing what happens. Yeah. So, what are your first thought? You know, your closing thoughts for this chapter as the start of a brand new book. I think Eustace is super annoying, but also ripe for change. Mm-hmm. So that could be really cool. Okay. I'm also curious to see what Edmund now with two visits to Narnia under his belt, what he'll yeah. Will he change more, or will he take on more of a role where he's helping other people mm-hmm. along their journey. Um, I also love that 
we don't have the older siblings there anymore and that's a completely different dynamic yeah yeah so everything's pretty well mixed up and we have the setting already established and my note at the very end of this chapter was here we go yeah i think one of the things that i really appreciated in reading this chapter is with you know i'm i'm sad to say goodbye to peter and susan but it feels like there's a little bit more room to breathe and also in this chapter only one character is really new to us right and it's just eustace who i would say really is you know the main character of this chapter he definitely gets more focused than anyone else does but we we know Edmund and Lucy at this point, so Lewis doesn't do a ton of you know backstory with them. We don't have to spend time like learning things about them. We already know them. We know Caspian from the last chapter, and so you there's a lot of character building here for Eustace, and everything else is just more like character moments, which I really appreciate. I I think one of the reasons this is my favorite book, and we'll unpack this a lot, is I think this is the best story from a character perspective in the seven books. It's just my opinion. And okay. I always have to say, I have not read The Horse and His Boy. So who knows? I, you know, it could change. But I just really, really love the character beats. And when you compare this to Caspian or Wardrobe, I think this one also just starts just like it's, it just starts with a bang. Where with Caspian, I remember you and, you know, I know you really liked it. I'm not as hot on Caspian as you were. I thought Caspian was kind of a kind of more of the same from the last time, in the, just in the first chapter, before they found the ruins and everything. And then wardrobe is uh, such a beautiful start. So it's not not at all a knock on that, but it's more of a slower start because Lucy's just kind of slowly discovering Narnia through the wardrobe, and she still hasn't figured out what it is. This is like here it all is. Let's go. Right. You know. And it's the benefit of building up a world, mm-hmm. and then you can just he's literally dropping characters in. Slightly different combination, took a few out, put them in a different setting, and it starts working immediately. Yeah. You have Reepicheep interacting with Eustace, and you know why Reepicheep's acting that way if you've read Prince Caspian. Mm-hmm. That's fantastic. All right, Phil, if you don't have any more thoughts, I think it's time to go into our listener feedback section. Let's do so. All right, well, we have a voicemail here from a listener uh, named Kate, and I'm just going to go ahead and play it. Hi, Phil and Daniel. I am a massive fan of the Chronicles of Narnia, and I have recently finished binging your entire back catalogue of episodes. I really love hearing you guys banter, as well as hearing Phil's thoughts as an effectively first-time reader. My personal favourite book in the series is The Magician's Nephew, so unfortunately I'm going to need to wait a few years to hear both of your thoughts on it. This brings me to a question I have, though. I would love to hear Phil's thoughts on what he thinks the rest of the Chronicles will entail, and what he thinks each later book is about. I think this would be super fascinating, and it would be interesting to see if he gets anything right. Thank you so much for this podcast. I look forward to hearing you work through more of the Chronicles. Further up and further in, Kate. Well, thank you for the voicemail, Kate. Yeah, thank you. Also, thank you for the extremely high quality that that recording was. Yeah, she, she sent over the audio file, and that's like, it doesn't, it was, yeah, it's high quality. It sounded lossless. Yeah. <laughs> so... My thoughts are, and I keep in mind, I do know a little bit because I've heard things here and there. Do you know that, just to pause for a second, do you know the names of all the rest of the books? The Horse and His Boy. No, that's not next. Is The Silver Chairs next? You didn't say in order. Oh, sorry. I just said the rest of the book. What what, what comes next? The Silver (laughs) Chairs. Correct. Um... The last battle. Nope. <laughs> That's it's the, the very last one. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the horse and his boy is number six. Nope. Number five. It's number five. Yeah. And the other one is... Kate just mentioned it in her voicemail. <laughs> the magician's nephew. Correct. Correct. So tell us, Phil, what do you think the silver chair is about? <laughs> and they're not spoilers because you don't know. <laughs> right. Well, actually, I do know. For this, the silver okay. chair, I know that someone sits in the chair. And it's really painful, and he says something about in the name of Aslan. Okay. So I do remember that part. That's it, though. Yeah. Um, I think that at some point, we're going to have to figure out how all these portals into Narnia got made. And the reason I think that is when I was preparing for this chapter, I thought, it sure is odd how there are all these things in people's houses that turn into Mm -hmm. portals to get them back to Narnia. The wardrobe and the picture so far. But the picture was given as a gift, and she can't get rid of it. And so it's there. And mm-hmm. it's just cool that I'm like, where did that picture come from? Who yeah. gave it to her? 
who originally painted that picture are we going to get to see those people Mm -hmm. so those are a few of the things that i think will happen i think we will um probably have a prequel or two but you don't know which one is a prequel i think we've talked about that before but i don't think the last battle is okay I think that the magician's nephew and the horse in his blue might be prequels. Okay. I think that the silver chair is going to be afterwards. Okay. So what do you think happens in the horse and his boy? And I, I don't know either. So I will both just be guessing. I think there's a horse. <laughs> so yeah. You don't, you don't know anything about that one. I don't. I, I, that one I'm probably the least familiar with. Okay. I think the magician's nephew has something to do with how the wardrobe gets built. How the wardrobe from the first book gets built. Right. Okay. And who who would be our main characters in it? Uh, Bobby and Larry and okay, so I people we haven't met yet or something. Yeah. Okay. And then the last battle. Oh, I do think the professor will play a role in one of the earlier books. Okay. So because you've hinted at that before. No, I have not. You have. <laughs> I watched. I'm just I don't have a good poker face. Um, also, what, we have it on audio, like that's it's recorded. True. What about the last battle? I think the last battle is going to be the piece de resistance. It's going to be. Pardon my French. I think it's going to, <laughs> I think it's going to be one big, really huge battle. Um, I think that the lady um, that Thor meets in Ragnarok is going to be there, and all the characters are going to come back. Okay. Yeah, I think it'll be um, like a really massive battle, but it's hard to imagine, like who who's going to be there because a lot of these battles have been fought, and a lot of time seems to pass. Mm-hmm. So I'm curious what'll happen. Also, okay. what's the battle going to be about? I don't know. Yeah, that's uh, that's some good stuff. That's exciting for me. I, I, dude, I'm so excited to get into the last battle. And just all these books. Um, but especially that one, I think with the last battle, there is so much for us to unpack there. Mm. And I think people are all over the place with their opinions on it. Yeah. And so I think that'll be really fun to to have listeners be able to share things as we're going through it and, and working through it. I mean that'll be I mean that, I think that's what four seasons from now. I just I can't wait for that. I know we got a couple of years until then, but I'm really excited about that. And then yet here we are still with Don Treader. This is a really fun thing we get to do. Yeah. Uh, well Kate, thank you so much for asking that. That I, I that was a great question. I hadn't even thought about that and I just enjoyed hearing Phil's response. So again thanks to Kate for sending us that email and letting us hear Phil's thoughts on the book. On the the upcoming books. Well, Phil, next time we'll be back with Chapter 2, and that is called On Board the Dawn Treader. And in that chapter, the children learn more about Caspian's voyage, so you'll be able to learn about why they're on this ship. Right, and that's a very interesting question. Yeah? Why are they on the ship? You don't know. We don't know. Okay, I, yeah. I think it's a cool thing to think about. That we don't already know. It's not just like, oh, hey, we're here, and we're just, you know, Yeah, because he he, they <laughs> intentionally, Lewis did not have him say... In the first chapter, mm-hmm. say, "Oh, I'm so glad you guys are here because we're gonna go fight a giant." What are the something. chances that this is just Caspian's vacation? And it's a, it's like a fishing trip. Well, that would explain why there's not really a main villain. <laughs> that's what it is. Just a fun. That's why I like. It's actually it's like a buddy comedy. Edmund and Caspian are just going out and they just they do some fishing and stuff. And uh, yeah, I'd read that still. I read. I think that's that gonna be rights. that's the kind of genre mixing that might happen if Quentin Tarantino really does a Star Trek. Ugh. Right, like, what's it gonna show. be like? <laughs> I don't dislike either of those things. I like both of them, but they should not be together. Yeah. Uh, and it's time to end the show. <laughs> um, well, this episode is made possible by our patrons over at patreon.com. If you'd like to support the show, you can listen to a, a bonus episode every single month uh, through the Dancing Lawn podcast that we do over there, along with other re- some other rewards, including stickers of the season artwork. Yeah, exactly. And the new season artwork that. Uh, shout out to Phil who created the new season artwork that y'all are looking at right now special thanks also goes out to Elias for supporting us at the Care Paravel level you can also follow us into Narnia on our Twitter or Facebook pages and if you have feedback you can leave that at the Narnia podcast at gmail.com or you can call us at 406-646-6733 If you'd have time, we would appreciate a review on Apple Podcasts because this helps other listeners find the show and join together in our read-through. Also, make sure you've subscribed to the show in your favorite podcast app so you can wake up to a new episode every other Wednesday. Thank you for coming along on this journey. We'll be back next time with Chapter 2. See you soon.